This is about wood for heating houses and, uh, uh, and hot water. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, first of all a case study of my experience of having installed one of those and it's going to open up a little bit. Um, we're here with Simon who uh, was the installer and supplies lots of different uh, technologies and with James who uh, manages sustainable uh, forests because so, supply of wood is a, big, um, is a big question ultimately. So I've said it's a, a learning curve and it certainly was. Um, uh, when in December 2008 we moved into, um, into a new house, we first visited it in the spring and summer and the, uh, with the sun streaming in, it all felt very wonderful. And I didn't pay too much attention to those little charts that are on the, the home information pack where they say, these ones are, I've nicked from some graph, but our ones are actually even worse. We're down here on the border between G and F with a 22 and a 35 for potential. And here it says not energy efficient, high running costs, and I think I, uh, we um, ig ignored that. Um, it wasn't really in our, in our minds at the time. Um, in the move that we made from Central Forest Road to two miles out of town, we left the mains gas, um, so we were on, um, on the oil system. And I don't think we'd uh, anticipate, we knew when we bought the house we were going to have to replace a very inefficient and not very good boiler and a uh, rusting old tank. We knew those would have to go, but we didn't know what we were going to do. Um, and we didn't know really what oil cost either. Um, so well, one of the first things we learned is that the oil prices never go down. In our last presentation here, they, they've described how the price had gone from in the, in the, the mid-30s, peaked um, in a, a winter 2010 and so on. But it's just going up and up and up. And I'm going to tell you later, which I just recently calculated, what we spent in our first two years um, on oil, and it was um, a scary, scary figure. Can you say what kind of house it is? Oh yeah, it's a, um, it is a large Sussex house that's been chopped up in three, so we've got a, a shape of it, it's facing <coughs> south and uh, southeast. Um, we have um, a solar PV panel, and we also uh, spend quite a lot of money on insulating certain windows, we have some very large windows, we double glaze those windows. Um, uh, and I should say that the solution and the route that we've gone down isn't as suitable to everybody. We had one we were lucky with some space. We had a boiler, a boiler room that um, wasn't very big, but had enough space for some of this equipment. And also, um, uh, we had some capital that we could invest in it uh, in, um, in in, in uh, changing the picture there with the uh, solar, with the um, uh, heat efficiency. Um, and in the course of what we've done, we've learned there's an awful lot you can do with wood as a fuel. As for heating or whatever, without going to the, to the lengths that we've gone through, gone to, and um, we'll uh, get to that. Um, so we um, we looked at a lot of different technologies. Um, we looked at um, stoves with back boilers, uh, providing hot water or contributing to a heating system. We looked at um, uh, pellet boilers, chip boilers, all of these different things. And in the, in the course of a two years to 18 month period, we um, had, I think, three different, four different um, quotes for different, for different systems. Um, and each of them, one of them was a, was a story and a, and a learning, because everybody is providing you with, um, a, a, you know, with a different viewpoint, a different technology. But we sort of narrowed down on, on what we thought would be the best technology which was a, a gasification boiler. It's, um, we'll see some pictures of it, the real system in a minute. Um, and what that means is it burns very large batches of wood. It does it in such a way there's a special controlled airflow that it burns very hot, burns very efficiently, and those gases are burned in a separate process. Um, so it achieves, according to the manufacturers anyway, something like 92% efficiency. It produces very little ash. Um, one of the problems we had, um, and we were almost on the point of committing to, uh, a system that wasn't quite of that kind of calibre. It was a less efficient system as, uh, at a smaller firm store. Um, uh, fortunately, we didn't, uh, because they, the company uh, uh, folded or something just as they were about to install. And we ended up going with uh, Simon's company, and we were very pleased that we did. Um, I think I'll show you what the system looks like. That's the, that's the boiler. Um, the lower chamber is where the gas is burned. 
That's the real installation in our house. The tank on the right is the hot water tank. And this thing on the left of the boiler is a, what is known as a thermal store. And I'm going to leave it to Simon to sort of answer any sort of technical questions about these things. But basically, the thermal store is like an enormous battery. It's got a 1,400 litre uh, capacity. You can get much, much larger ones. And the, uh, the reason you have one of those is you burn through a batch of logs in five hours or maybe longer. And that um, thermal store heats up to 80, 90, 100 uh, degrees and is like a battery that you then run your hot water off and your heating off. So you don't have to get up at five in the morning, shove logs in to have, a, have a central heating in your house. Um, you can have a, a programmable system as much as you would. All you need to do is to work out a system and a process to be able to maintain that at, um, at a, a hot temperature so that it will drive the other things. Um, the other element, I'm just going to go back a sec to how long does it keep hot? hot? Okay. Um, well, that really depends on how much you use it. Um, I'm just going to go back to the, this diagram because the other thing I haven't said is that we have a solar. We also have a solar thermal feed-in system. So we've ended up with three modes of operation. In the summer, we're getting almost all our hot water from the solar panel, and occasionally, maybe. Uh, one, you know, in a, in a rainy August, for instance, we're having to burn um, to heat the hot, heat the thermal store. Uh, you know, maybe once a week or something, and it will then, for a few hours, it will dry the hot water system. Um, in spring and autumn, we um, are doing every two, like we are now, every two or three days, we'll do a burn, heat that thermal store up, and that will provide us with hot water when we need it. So when we're in deep winter, then we're having to do two or three burns a day, um, and that will then give us hot water, uh, heat and hot water that we want. Um, so that, this thing up here is the thermal, is the solar panel on the roof. What's not shown on here is that we have a hot water tank as well as the thermal store. Half a small wheelbarrow <laughs> of logs. So it's and quite that's a lot of. Tank. No, you have to probably burn oh, two, a whole wheelbarrow full of wood to, to heat the whole tank. But it also depends. I mean, if you're in, thank you very much, if you're in um, deep winter and the ambient temperature is um, zero or minus, raising that huge body of water up to 70, 80, 90 degrees is much more difficult than it is now or has been. You know, so we're using much less wood to achieve that in the summer months or in the spring and autumn than we are. The problem we have with Rupert's is everything went through a door like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we were limited on the size of the store um, and also on the size of the floor as well. So um, the, the thermal store is actually an oval, long oval shape that it, it literally just fitted through the door. Um, so it's... Uh, a limiting factor on what you could get in. So, yeah, yeah, so what you, won't, you can't see it yet. It's, a, it's about, so it's about so high and it's about that long it's a, and it's you know, deeply insulated uh, all around. And that little temperature gauge is the, is the temperature gauge on the, the idea of a thermal store is not to let them go cold. Uh, once they're up to temperature, you want to make, it's cheaper to maintain it than it is to keep trying to heat it up all the time. Yeah, and there you can see we have, you know, the sort of control panels all of you'll be familiar with with the central heating system. Those still operate. I'm going to try and move uh, as quick as possible so that we can have time for questions and so on. But the, one of the key things is about having dry wood, and if that's when a tree is cut down, and that and that's the humidity of the wood, 85%. By a year, it's starting to get dry enough to be able to burn efficiently. Um, but really, and James is going to talk more about that in a minute, about you, know, you need to be seizing wood for two years um, in order to get it uh, dry enough. In our first year, I thought I'd laid in a lot, a lot of wood. I had big pallets and wood stacked up and covered and everything like that. I hadn't stored it correctly. 
for a start and I hadn't bought, in, bought nearly enough, so after six weeks we burned through what I thought was a year's worth of wood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was in uh, January last year. So thanks for the learning curve on that. So we started storing wood in little ramshackle places all over the garden. And then finally And this will have to be cut to a specific length to fit your boiler. Yeah, this, um, well in fact, the other the stuff that we were buying randomly or cutting ourselves or, or uh, whatever was, was at the size that whatever anybody was prepared to bring it at. Um, but James, who supplied me this, this year, cut it to the maximum specified length of that uh, boiler, which is 500. Uh, uh, half a meter, mm. basically, and that is about um, that log shed has capacity for about 20 cubic meters of wood, and I reckon I'm hoping that will uh, see us through. What would it cost you to fill that? And that costs around well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but um, <laughs> <laughs> about 750 pounds. And you're buying that pre, pre season, so it's ready to use. That was bought, yeah, it's been down uh, for, for two years at least. Um, so how long, 750 pounds will fuel for how long? I think that will pay for all of our winter, since we don't, in this, uh, for a year, let's say a year's uh, heating and hot water. Um, the system that we installed, that I just showed you there, um, costs in total about 17,000, which is quite a scary uh, uh, amount of money. And um, we spent, I calculate, um, in the two years before we installed the system, we spent um, £4,400 on oil. I only just worked that out, and that's a bit of a shocker. So that's about £2,200. So based on that, on the sort of £750 versus £2,000. So your house must be quite big, though. It is, it's, a, it's a fairly big house, yeah. So that is six, seven bedrooms? Or something? No, no, it's a four bedroom house. It has one very large room. Because really? uh, it's, it's a, a section of a larger house. It's not, um, right. not everything is in. Uh, um, but it is, it's got, you know, lots of spaces, but we don't try to heat the whole, we're not walking around in t-shirts in winter, you know, we heat some parts of the house and other parts not. We have other, you know, we have a wood-burning uh, cooker in the, in the kitchen that we use, and that, you know, for most of the year, it's all the heat that we need, ambient heat we even need anyway. We also have a wood-burning uh, stove for that big room. Uh, but still, some sort of central heating in bedrooms and stuff like that in winter is, um, is needed. So. Did, did you have to adapt any of the existing heating system, or was this um, plug straight in and keep working? I don't think anything about that plug straight in did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we basically the, the existing heat and as in radiators um, was pretty much stayed as it was. Um, we updated all the controls on the heat because originally it was a hot water cylinder with an oil boiler and a gravity fed hot water system. Um, we updated all the controls on that, so everything was fully pumped. Um, but as in the main house, we, we didn't do a massive amount, did we? No, no, you yeah. do, it, the existing radiator network mm -hmm. and hot water circuits and so on, they could all stay. Right. I mean, the biggest challenge was getting the, the flue liner down the chimney. Um, with these, with any kind of uh, new boiler system, you need a new, you know, you need a flue liner. So whether we were putting in, replacing with an oil boiler or whatever, we would have needed one. Um, and uh, and that was a, that was really tricky, and there was an asbestos set, uh, set section in there um, as well that had to come out, so that was kind of as well. Um, Probably just to find a new system. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I reckon the payback, just based on, I mean that seems to be something that's obviously very um, high in people's minds, um, and this is not including government. Uh, Grants for this sort of, sort of system because they they are going to bring those in. Um, there is, there's a, a voucher scheme. You, you know a little bit about that. Don't you? Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, I'm saying. Um, I'm I'm thinking about 10, 11 years to uh, at current oil prices based on on the old system you had, which was inefficient. So it's it may be it may be more like 50 if you had a modern oil boiler. Maybe it would be a longer longer payback. Right. Maybe shorter if the price of oil keeps doing that. Or maybe short of the prices, price of oil. Like we just, I mean, you know, just one oil is expensive. Two, it's a, it's smelly. We had it. We had, uh, you know, there was a, 
the, the boiler room was actually in the, in the part of the house, you know, under the stairs. And, you know, there was smell of kerosene in bedrooms and things like that because of some seeping leak that no one could find. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a horrible, expensive fuel. And I don't know if any of you have, have experience with those. Those the, the companies bringing around, are, there's a cartel sort of on pricing operating, mm -hmm. and they are terrible. I've had an experience of um, uh, bad sales people and so on. Um, saying, oh, this price they're quoting you includes VAT when it doesn't, and so on. But I think a big, the, you know, the big learning was around, was around wood supply. You need to have dry wood and you need to have enough of it. And you can't be, you know, as I did in my first year, be chopping and lugging and doing all that kind of thing day in, day out. It was great, you know, my back problems disappeared once I got my axe technique sorted down. But, um, uh, so now I have a log shed that's a few, you know, a few short steps from where, um, where the boiler is, uh, rather than uh, traipsing halfway across the garden and so on. So um, I think it'd be a good moment now to hear about the, 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 um, the, the scheme that will... Um, uh, the, the RHI. The RHI, the government yeah. scheme that will give you um, grants for this kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, we don't know when it's going to start, um, how much it's going to be. There is a, a call to the, R, the Renewable Heat Incentive Premium Payment, which is available at the moment. Um, it's uh, £950 for wood burning boilers, uh, £1,200 for heat pumps, and I think it's £350 for solar thermal. Um, the commercial RHI is actually running at the moment. So um, basically, all the heat you produce from your wood burning boiler is metered. Um, Every quarter, the, um, you'll get a phone call saying, can you read your meter and tell me what it is? Um, you tell them what the reading is, and they will pay you back per kilowatt. It's 7.8p <coughs> per kilowatt of energy produced. Um, the last one I worked out pellet boiler was uh, a 38 kilowatt pellet boiler. Um, and I think their payback yearly was estimated to be around about £11,000. Um, because they have a massive, it will be used literally 24 hours a day. Um, the domestic RHI, we are literally, we're still waiting. They're going to make an announcement they promised at the end of this month. So, um, yeah, I know that's what they promised two months ago, the month before that. But, um, I was at a, a sort of mini conference a couple of weeks ago and uh, they, they sort of laid their neck on the line and said it will be end of November. So. That's as far as we know. But it, it's the same with uh, the, the reason the feeding tariffs were put in for the solar, for solar PV was because it was an expensive um, option to do. And the reason they're doing the RHI is because it, you know, it's not changing an oil boiler for £3,000. You're spending upwards of £15,000 on these systems. So the RHI, the RHI is there as an incentive for you to you know, put your neck out and, and, and change for these fuels. So. But as Rupert's just said, you know, even without the RHI, the, the, the payback, if you're on oil or even more, if you're on LPG or electric, the, the, the payback is there without any incentive from the government anyway. So, you and know, it is. Of your own supply, exactly, yeah. But it is, as, as Rupert will tell you, it, it's, um, it's more of a lifestyle change than a heating system, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you've got to be prepared. Yeah, you've got to work out of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that wood warms you twice, isn't it? Once yes. when you burn it. So. But isn't the issue also saying, what about wood supply? Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know James is going to talk about it, but I mean, if, if a lot of people convert to these kind of boilers, <laughs> what's going to happen with the wood price and, how, and availability of wood? The thing wood? is, uh, and I mean, you all you live in a wooded area. I mean, you know, five years ago, or even two years ago, you, you could walk through the forest and there'd be trees laying down and they've been there 10 years right away. That, that doesn't happen anymore. People are managing the forest, I mean, they're, you know, what is becoming a commodity, so it's the, you know, but this is, this is the man to tell you about. Yeah. We need to move, we're getting yeah, towards we're the end of time. time. Yep. We're running out of time, so James, give us some, I mean, the bigger, some of the questions yeah. about wood, wood supply and wood, is wood generally a, uh, genuinely a renewable fuel? It, it is, but I mean, it is relatively limited. I, 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 not everyone can jump on this wood burning bandwagon. Well, that would be my feeling. It, it's, it's not, you, it's the problems of the infrastructure, the people actually to do the harvesting. Um, 
as a forestry contractor, it's very hard actually to set up a business around here because the planning and so on. A lot of the woodland is owned by people who don't want trees cut down, and you just can't get in there to, to manage them. The Forestry Commission are doing their best, and they were hoping to bring another two million cubic meters of, of woodland of produce from woodlands into the into the production stream. That was their their objective, um, but I don't know how far they're getting with it. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, I, I think I, I don't think that there will be certain cases. I mean, Rupert was a very good example where he, if you're on oil, I think it'd be a good field to, to go to to wood. If you're in a wooded area, it makes sense in terms of sustainability. The wood only has to travel five miles instead of from Saudi Arabia or somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, with the oil. And, um, but if you're on mains gas, I think it, it, it would probably be a bit silly to, to put in one of these systems because yeah. there's no way that wood is going to replace mains gas as a, as a universal fuel. We, Britain has very small quantities of wood relative to the population of the market. So it's, it's never going to be a, a, you know, a massive solution to the energy problem. I, but it just is a local solution yeah. I think, in certain cases. I read um, some information the other day that in Austria there's four hectares per person of woodland. In England it's 0 0.2 hectares per person. <laughs> so just to give you an idea. Mm. Of, you know. Do you Good. know what, what portion is of, of wooded area that you need to sustain a certain square meterage of house? Yeah. That depends what it is, where it is, you know, it, it, there's just so many variables. Really. I mean, for Rupert, do you know how much, screen, how much hectares your woodlot requires energy to keep you going? I haven't worked that out yet. We could, I mean, we it, could. Yeah, we could work it out. I mean, it, you've had five loads, haven't you? Five loads. I think. Yeah. Uh, so each load's four cubic metres. So 20 loose, cubic metres. Uh, 20 cubic metres loose, which would be 10 solid, 10 tonnes green of wood per year for one house. Mm -hmm. And the woodlands around here will grow at about five tons or five that's cubic metres at, per hectare per yeah. year. So that's about so he two needs two hectares, hectares the yeah. annual increment on two hectares mm -hmm. um, to supply one house. <laughs> and two hectares is, you know, five acres or something. It's, yeah. So it's, it's a long house. It's quite a, but that's what I'm saying, a, it's never going to, you can't sure, have every house sure, sure. running on wood. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we do have the situation where we have no culture of burning wood, really. The woodlands have been neglected for many years. There's a big capital stock of wood standing, mm -hmm. a lot of it just falling down. Mm -hmm. um, and it would also be highly beneficial. The consensus is that uh, the woodlands are really getting too dark and is actually having a negative impact, not cutting trees down <laughs> on the wildlife, if you like, in the habitat. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there is a good reason to go in there and cut wood down. And it, it'll be sustainable and everything else, but it just isn't going to be a, a universal solution. But not necessarily clear felling. Clear felling, a coppicing is clear felling, the very oldest form of woodland management. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it, you know, you, you just need to, to make a, a sort of sensible decision, that, a, a sensitive decision yeah. on, on each case. You don't have a, there's, no, there's not going to be a blanket prescription. And in terms of the type of wood that, that you can put into these, I mean, you presumably you can put any kind of wood into these borders. And, 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 and what's what and what's managed in the woodlands? What's what's the most burn efficient type? Of I don't. Uh, well, I don't. Some yeah, yeah, I mean, the best kind of if you, you know, kind of burning, which is beach. Every area is normally tested on beach, but <coughs> um, it, it does vary. You know mm. what you're burning to. You know, well, actually, I've got it here. So I mean, calorific value. Um, yeah, it's not going to be It varies from. Uh, 2.8 um, kilowatts per kilogram up to 4.2 kilowatts on beach, you know, depending on the wood you're burning. So but the crucial thing, <coughs> is more, far more than the species of wood, is the dryness. Okay. Yeah, under 20 percent. If it's not, you know, and and really, if you you can't really specify a type of wood, so the woodland manager, especially if he's doing his job right, is is trying to manage for the benefit of the woodland. No, I understand. So that. you'll be producing wood. So I never specify a species. I, I always say I'm just selling energy. Yeah. And I just try, try to keep a sort of consistent level over, you know, year to year, customer to customer. But it has to be mixed species in, um, at, at a practical level. To um, give, give you an idea of the moisture, if, 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 we, if we size a pellet store to take 20 tonne of wood chip at 20% moisture content, if they are burning 30% moisture content, we need a 30 tonne of That's the volume, you know, extra you need for that 10% moisture. Mm -hmm. So the moisture content is key with, you know, with any, any wood you're burning on any plants, 
it just leaves even you know your log burner in your house. So, um, what about waste wood? Uh, yeah, technically not that burn waste wood, but um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we you know we we fit stoves, you know, for, for, for carpenters and joiners, uh, uh, you know, bringing stuff off the of sites and stuff. So, but the the key with with the boiler that Rupert's got is if you can cut a log to suit that boiler, you'll get a lot more out of it than you will do putting little higgledy piggledy bits in there. So, um, the other yeah. thing, you know, just to reinforce what you were saying, our own personal experience is of putting wet wood into, or wetter wood, we have a little hygrometer, a little two-pronged thing that we push into the, into the wood. Um, uh, normally, you know, some people have promised me and sworn blind they would deliver wood that's uh, 20% or less, mm. and then what turns up, I've actually won't even let them take it off the truck now. And <laughs> 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 you know, it's like this, you won't get drier than this, uh, honest, uh, and it's <laughs> those five and, and more. So it has made such a, you know, and our, our system runs, you know, the amount, you, the amount of heat you get and the amount of wood you have to put in, you know, on dry wood, so much less. You get more, more heat and use less. And, you know, when you are using dry wood, there's very little ash, you know, coming out of it. There's not a lot of waste. Are we out of time, Mike? I think we are, so thank you very much. Thank you.